Hi, I'm Hassan, the lecturer here at the Institute of Medical Education, and today we're going to go through solutions to Section 3 of ACES GAMS at Green Booklet, Practice Test 1, uh, specifically Unit 14, questions 52 to 54. And in this unit, we're going to take a look at the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, specifically focusing on um, different sized mammals, ranging from elephants to mice. And um, before we dive into the unit, I think it's important we understand what these curves are telling us. So first, hemoglobin, it's a molecule that can bind up to four oxygen molecules in a reversible method. And we usually see it in this nice S-shaped curve. So in this curve, we see that on the, on the y-axis, we see hemoglobin saturation. And on the x-axis, we see the um, partial pressure of oxygen. I think at the beginning, it's in capillaries. And towards the end, it's in the lungs. Um, but we see the generation of this sigmoidal curve. So the shape of the curve here results from the interaction of the bound oxygen with hemoglobin. So once one oxygen binds, it makes it easier, as we can see here. So I'll just draw a nice graph. So you can see how it just, it kind of, the, the slope of the graph becomes very, very steep. So that shows you that it becomes easier for hemoglobin to pick up oxygen. And um, then obviously towards the end, it gets saturated. So that's why we're generating this S shape. And the reason why it's important that we understand why it generates this S shape is because you can see that if you're picking up oxygen easier from, say, if you have one oxygen balances hemoglobin, it becomes easier. That also means it becomes easier to lose oxygen as you lose, I mean, to lose oxygen molecules as you lose one oxygen molecule. So you can see that as it goes up, it picks up more and more oxygen molecules as you pick up more. As it goes down, you lose more and more oxygen molecules as you lose oxygen molecules. So it's a nice reversible curve. So how can we manipulate this curve? Um, it's important to note that um, there, there is a term you might have heard, the Bohr effect. So what that means is if we shift the curve to the right or to the left, so um, the strength, I guess, of which of oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it can be affected by temperature, 2, 3, by phosphoglyceric acid, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and the acidity. So an example here is exercise. That's probably one example I like using to teach students. So if you think about it, um, when you exercise, you're going to increase the acidity, so decrease your pH. Carbon dioxide is going to increase in the blood. You're going to increase your, increase your body temperature which means we're going to shift our curve to the right. And why? Because it just means that our affinity for oxygen is going to decrease. But students always tell me, why would the, oxygen fifth, why would the affinity for oxygen decrease? Well, the reason why it decreases is because if you have less affinity for oxygen at hemoglobin, it's more likely to offload the oxygen to the tissues. So therefore, so if you think about it, let's look at the graph here. It means you need more oxygen to, um, I guess, more oxygen available to bind to the hemo to saturate the hemoglobin, which means it, the hemoglobin is less affinity for oxygen. And you might think, well, um, in exercise, this is important because obviously if we're exercising, all those um, factors are at play, we have to increase the unloading of the oxygen to our tissues so that we can recover quickly or, or to, I guess, um, pump out that extra rep or that set at the gym. So you probably noticed straight away now that if, because you probably looked at figure one in the stimulus or in the unit, mice have, a, their, their curves compared to let's say an elephant is shifted completely to the right, which means that they're going to have more unloading of oxygen at their tissues. And you can ensure therefore that mice or smaller um, mammals or smaller organisms are going to have a higher metabolism and they're going to, uh, as the, I think we, as question 53, which we'll go through, it's going to have a higher metabolic rate than say the bigger animals. And you can see that clearly. So if you had this prior knowledge um, beforehand, you would have not had to have obviously looked at the graph to answer the questions. So you'd know straight away. And um, in obviously the Bohr effect can work in the opposite direction. So you can see that if you have increased um, pH, decreased acidity, 
decreased temperature, um, obviously decreased 2,3 BPG, uh, you'd shift the graph to the left. So obviously it is a, again, it's a dynamic system. So if we take a look at question 54, it's asking, oh, sorry, jump the gun here. Uh, if we take a look at question 52, it's asking us here that um, uh, in the muscle capillaries of a mammal, the oxygen partial pressure is 40 millimeter mercury and the saturation of hemoglobin is 62%. So if we draw a line on figure one in the unit, it corresponds to about a sheep. So we know that the animal has to be somewhere about the size of a sheep, no greater than a man or a horse, and no smaller than a fox. So if we take a look at the options given, it can't be a bat or a rabbit, so A and D. We can't have those because those are too small. A camel is a bit big. You know, camels are probably the sizes of horses or they're a bit bigger than that. So it doesn't look like it's going to be a camel. And the only option there that kind of fits is a wolf. I mean, wolves can be massive, but generally they're about the same size as humans. Or I'd say about the same size of a, a sheep or let's say a dog. So, um, but they are a bit bigger than a dog. So the answer for 52 has to be B. So if we move on to question 53, it's asking of the following, which, which what's most consistent with the fact that smaller animals, smaller mammals have, so we kind of went through this in the intro, it, it, because the, the mammal's curve, is sh the smaller mammals like mice's curve is shifted to the right, they're going to have a decreased affinity for oxygen, which means they're going to have more unloading of oxygen in the tissue, which means their metabolic rate is going to be a lot more rapid than the, let's say, the elephant, which curve is shifted to the left. So you know straight away, without even having to read all the options, it has to be B. But if we take a look at the other options anyway, A says thicker capillary walls than larger mammals. That's not true. By virtue of size, you'd ensure that, say, the elephant would have a lot much... <laughs> their capillary walls will be a lot bigger than the mice. Um, C says surface area, smaller surface area, which is not true. Small mammals have larger surface area than bigger mammals. And even in saying that, I think surface area to volume ratio is more uh, in line with thermoregulation in this instance. And finally, um, so we can cross off those. D, capillaries are more variable cross-sectional area than larger animals. I mean, it's variable between species. So D is incorrect. So if we move on now to, um, sorry, I'll clear the screen. If we move on now to question 54, it's asking us the if a hemoglobin uh, molecule, so obviously it consists of four subunits, which can each bind an oxygen, which we talked about in the intro. Um, if we have a saturated hemoglobin molecule and it loses an oxygen from one subunit, what happens? So if we take a look at our curvy, you can see if we lose a subunit, it becomes so much easier to lose more. Sorry, if we lose oxygen, it becomes so much easier to lose more oxygen. It's the same process as we talked about in the intro. If you gain an oxygen, it becomes so much easier to gain more oxygens. So therefore, the answer for 54, if we lose, if we're fully saturated and we lose an oxygen, it becomes easier to lose the second and third oxygen molecules. So the answer for 54 has to be C. So look, if you have any more questions or questions that uh, are burning or pressing that you want answered, you can post them in the comment section uh, or you can contact us directly. We'd love to help you. Um, in terms of uh, answering questions relating to hemoglobin uh, or oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curves, I do uh, employ you to go back Understand what the graph is actually telling you. What does it mean by shifting left to right? What is the Bohr effect? What can affect this shift? Um, what, how, why do we generate this S curve? And um, if you, you might want to go one step further. What is it like the curve in a fetal uh, system? So, like in a in a fetus, what's the curve going to be shifted left or right? I mean, it does get shifted to the left in the fetus, but why? So, have a look. Um, these are the sorts of things you should be studying and looking into so that if it does come up in the game set, you'll be um, very ready to answer whatever comes your way. Well, thanks for your time. Bye now.